Welcome to Unscripted with Russo. I'm your host, Ashley Russo, president and executive producer of The Peak TV. For our podcast, we decided to explore the people behind the narratives. I'll introduce decision makers and influencers who are winners in their field and find out the intimate story behind their rise to success. Welcome to Unscripted with Russo. I have such a fun guest with me today, my good friend, Matt Petrozelli. And Matt is from Valley National Financial Advisors, and he's here joining us today. Matt, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So I want to know a little bit about your background. Before we get into anything with your job and your career and running a small business, I know we have a lot in common with that. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? I grew up actually in Connecticut. Okay. I'm not originally from the Lehigh Valley. I grew up in Connecticut um, in a small town called Richfield, which is about 50 miles north of New York City. Um, and what first brought me to the Valley was uh, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of Lehigh University, so I attended Lehigh University. Um, so you were on the south side, you moved down here, you thought you were just coming to college. Yeah, yeah. Well, Did you ever envision that you would be living here? Maybe. Maybe at some point. Um, I did meet my future wife at Lehigh, who uh, was from the area. So we had some ties, and I got to know a little bit about the, the Lehigh Valley at that point. But um, upon graduation, I lived in New York City for 10 years. Uh, 11 years actually, and then moved here about five or six years ago. When you were a little kid growing up in Connecticut, tell me about your family. You have siblings. What about your parents? What was your family life like? Yeah, I had, a, I had kind of a really all-American childhood. Um, my dad worked for a large corporation for IBM for 31 years. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, That's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, he traveled a lot. We stayed at home. Um, I have an older sister who's an attorney. Um, and she's the smart one of the family. She, she went to law school, and um, I kind of went up the sales and trading ladder. Um, kind of kind of learned learned things the hard way, but um, yeah, it was just a, a really nice place to grow up. Uh, kind of the white picket fence, Norman Rockwell type painting. Uh, you know, football captain in high school kind of a thing. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about sports. Yeah. And, you know, what were you involved in? Like, what were the things you were drawn to? Yeah, so I played football quite a bit. Um, not good enough to play in college, obviously, but good enough to play in a small town Connecticut team. Uh, I played a lot of baseball growing up and I played a lot of golf. So those were kind of the three things that I did. And I, you know, my dad played golf growing up. So I kind of grew up with a golf club in my hand. Nice. Something and that's something like together. we do together. We still do together. So that's really I love nice. that. I know yeah. it's been my, my husband's an avid golfer, as you know, okay. and we've been waiting and waiting because my son has had no interest. Okay. And um, it was actually caddying that got him back into wanting to play. Right. So yeah. it was two years of caddying and working and learning the sport and meeting people. And they said, maybe I'm going to try this again. And of course, you know, kids, they pick it up and you're just like, ah, how are you so good at that already? <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah, That's amazing. So. What about um, other hobbies as a kid? Like, tell me about what, what was like the seven-year-old you like? What kind of student were you? What kind of kid were you? Were you a rule follower? Are you you know, I was um, really into sports, really competitive. Um, I was probably an average student as a seven-year-old, um, but really loved being outside, exploring, doing sports, being with friends. Friends, um, all those types of things. When you think about your parents now, are there any lessons or things that they instilled in you that you feel now as a parent you're looking back and saying like, oh, thank goodness that they did that for me? Yeah, I mean, they always taught my sister and I independence. I grew up in a small family. Um, we didn't have a lot of aunts and uncles or anybody around, so it was really just kind of the core four of us. Um, so really preaching independence, paving your own path, um, you know, take the road less traveled, get out and see the world, um, and make a name for yourself, work hard, be respectful, be ethical. Um, all those kind of really core philosophies were preached at an early early age. And when you were in high school and you were sort of thinking about what next steps were, where what kind of schools were you looking at? I mean, was Lehigh a top choice for you? Was it What, what were you looking for in a college? Yeah, I, I always make a joke that Lehigh was my stretch school. Um, <laughs> it's really where I wanted to go. My dad was a Lehigh graduate. So I grew up, um, I didn't have, as I mentioned, I didn't have a lot of immediate family around. So we, we used to go vacation with his friends from Lehigh and his college uh, fraternity brothers. And I saw they all had beautiful wives and good jobs and loved to hang out at Lehigh. And I was like, this is for me. This is really cool. So, it was, so you knew that was a place you I knew, to go. you know, early in high school, that's where I wanted to go. And I was really motivated to get my grades up and to, you know, I was president of student council and all that. So I had the social 
aspect of uh, being a good Lehigh prospect. I just needed to work on the grades, and I was able to do that by just really knowing what I wanted and, and getting into Lehigh. It's interesting when you have a goal and something to go towards, how much that can motivate you. You know, it's, a, it's always, I have teenagers now. You're not quite there yet. No, no, no. But, you know, it's, it's hard to externally motivate them. You know, there has to be something within that they feel that they're driving towards. Right. And, uh, and I love that you kind of had that. When you talk about the student council, tell me about your campaign. I want to hear about this campaign that you ran. Now, were you on student council before becoming student council president? Yes. You were on the path. Yes. You were on the path to politics. Yes. Okay. Yes. How did you make that decision? Like, why was that something you were drawn to? Um, I've always been involved in leadership and politics and um, they sell pompous, but I always feel like I was well-liked. So um, I, I really wanted to give back. I always wanted to be involved. I always wanted to help people that couldn't be helped. And I felt when I was young and you, you're naive that student council is a way to do that, right? Free, free pizza on Wednesdays and all the things you're going to do, but yeah. you're actually not going to do it. Um, <laughs> so for me, it was more just kind of when I was a freshman in high school, kind of getting involved just as a kind of a regular student council member. And there really wasn't much campaigning to do. And I think when I was a senior and kind of running, um, you know, as a, as a elected officer, it was more people knew who I was. They knew I could represent them. Did you have a platform? I did not have a platform. My platform. Did well, you have buttons? I did not have buttons. Gosh, what kind of campaign was this, Matt? Uh, it wasn't very good, but somehow, <laughs> somehow, somehow it worked. worked. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, I think I was friends with a lot of people. Something that I really believe in today. I see bullying and all that other things with kids and being captain of the football team and being on student council. It gave me an opportunity to make a difference in a lot of kids' lives that maybe were picked on and I could stick up for them or invite them to do things that they didn't have the opportunity to do because they weren't necessarily in those social cliques or they're going through socially awkward times in their life. And that is something that always really stuck with me. Um, some of the best friendships I had in high school were people you never thought I'd be friends with because nobody ever really gave them a chance. And I think when you say what my platform was, now that it's, this was a long time ago, now that I'm talking to you about this, I think that was one of the reasons why is because it wasn't just one section of students that was... Yeah, kind of bridged the, the gap. I was able to get people. along with almost everybody. And, yeah. and that served me very well in college and served me well as president of my fraternity in college. And it served me very well in business. Yeah, it's so important, you know, people take for granted, you know, they talk about everybody wants to get in their clique and that time of right. life is so challenging. But I think that if you can kind of be inclusive and bridge the gap, it is amazing how many people you can pull together. Yeah, it is. So you go to Lehigh. Yep. Do you know right away what you want to study? What did you study? Uh, I actually studied international relations and history. Really? So I was an okay. arts and sciences major, yep. Okay, and was there a draw to that? Was it something that you wanted to travel or you wanted to be in government? I mean... All, all of the above. So I was really passionate about politics um, when I was young. I was really passionate about history. I'm still a major history buff. It's like my big passion outside of sports and work. Um, oh my and gosh, family. have you yeah. and Joe ever talked about this? We have not, no. Okay, so next time you see Joe, my husband, yeah. you'll have right, to talk Joe, about that's history. Cat's so. out of the bag now. Yeah. All right, I know, he loves history. He's doing this thing called the Great Courses. Have you ever heard of them? No. Oh, you have to look online. It's okay. great. So I think back in the day, they were like probably mailed you VHS tapes or something. Yeah. Like you'd get an encyclopedia. Yeah. But now there's this whole catalog on, I think it's through Apple TV or something. Yeah. And you can sign up for a monthly subscription and you can literally take a course on anything. It's unbelievable. That's cool. It will blow your mind. Yeah. It's so great. So he'll be like, I'm watching something on Japanese food culture tonight. Are you interested? And sometimes I'm like, no. Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes yes. I'm sometimes like, sometimes yes. No. But if you like history, everything historical there, great courses. Yes. Yeah, so okay. um, I'm really fascinated by people. Like when I talk about history and international relations, it's all about how do people interact with each other to do great things or to build things that really impact a lot of other people and really this leadership and how interesting people from different walks of life can be some of the most famous people and most successful people of their time. I think that's such a fascinating thing about history. And we can go back, whether it's European history, US history, and, and, and just read about interesting people and where they came from and what they accomplished. So that's kind of was really one of my big passions. I did think that I wanted to be in government I think when you're younger, you have kind of a naive view of what being in government is. So after my sophomore year, I did a summer abroad in London and actually worked for the British Parliament. So this oh, was wow. in the summer of 2001. So this was right before 9-11. Um, oh, my god! So the biggest issue, Tony Blair at the time was the prime minister. The biggest issue in Parliament was whether to let Jerry Springer on BBC. 
Really? And the, eth- the ethics of the British people weren't going to let that American trash on their television. And so it's And amazing. they stood firm on that one, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah, thought yeah. so. Um, anyway, uh, after 9-11, that kind of changed the whole dynamic of really everything as kind of a junior in college. So after my junior year of college, when everybody was rushing out to get an internship at Wall Street or wherever they were going to end up the rest of their life, I decided to attend National Outdoor Leadership School, which is called Knowles. Um, I loved being outside, and it was basically, I spent the whole summer. And where at, is that? Uh, it's all over the world. Okay. So at the time, I did it in the Yukon Territory of Alaska. Oh so my gosh. I was like resupplied by plane. I didn't take a shower for like 75 days. I didn't shave. I know it's hard to imagine. Do you have pictures from that I time? I do. Okay. I do. I'll show we'll you sometime. We'll have to have those put up on this podcast okay. so that all that's, the people listening are now seeing I what much, I have not yet seen. I'm much younger and much thinner because <laughs> I didn't really eat or drink but anything while I was out much there. much hairier. <laughs> yeah, much hairier. Actually, um, I have a nice picture uh, right before we finish the trip because uh, one of the people on the trip trimmed our beards with a Swiss Army knife. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. What an incredible experience. I mean, what did you take from that time kind of in the wilderness. You know, for me, I just needed to have and do something that was a sense of adventure, but it also had to have purpose. It wasn't just like, go sit on a remote island for two months and find yourself. I didn't need to find myself, but I wanted to do something that I could say, I'm never going to do this again in my life. And I also was really interested in leadership and survival and developing skills. And ironically, when I joined Fidelity Investments, which was really kind of the big step up for me in my career when I was very young, it was the Knowles on my resume that my manager told me was the reason that I got selected for the, inter- that for the interview. That stands out, It right? stood yeah. out as this guy is really out there working on his, his life, you know? So for me, it was just after 9-11, it was a real aha moment for me to just get away and get out. I'm going to be in an office. I'm going to wear a suit for the rest of my life. Why would I want to do that my junior year in college. And I know that's very sacrilege today in in college world, but it was a risk I had to take, and it was a risk that paid off. You know, you talk a little bit about how it was the thing on your resume that made you stand out. Right. Now, as an employer and someone looking, and I'm an employer too, you know, it's funny, we can teach skills Mm -hmm. within the industry that whatever industry we're in, but those soft skills, those life skills, and finding somebody who's working on themselves as a person, as a professional, how do you, how important is that to you as an employer? And, and do you look for it? In, in our business, which is financial services around individuals and families, it's about caring for people and wanting to make a difference in people's lives, right? We can teach them the difference between a stock, a bond, and a mutual fund, but we can't teach them how to care for people. We can't teach them to put their clients' interests ahead of themselves. Um, so we look for skills that really show that, whether it's volunteerism, it's being involved in the community, um, it's not all just finance, finance, finance. It's, you know, what soft skills do they have as well? Because being a genius in finance is only going to take you so far. Yeah. Um, successful people, getting back to kind of that history research, they have really good people and soft skills and um, can rally people around them in different ways to do things that others can't. You also have to have the technical capability, but that, that can come over time. Yeah, and I think that you can learn those things. But like sure. you said, the other pieces are harder to learn. You know, I want to get back to, to meeting your wife because, of course, she's a friend of mine and yes. a wonderful, wonderful, smart, brilliant woman. Yes. Um, but you you now are raising your kids, mm-hmm. and they're little. They are. But when you think about those sort of soft skills and those things, what are important? What pieces are important to you as you're teaching them, you know, life lessons? And they're starting to, of course, right now they're a little bit in the stage of just – functional skills, right? But you're starting those lessons. What are they? What as a parent and as a person and as a couple do you want your kids to know that that you find is hard to teach to employees? Well, with my kids, so my oldest is four and a half and he's got a one-year-old sister who's actually 15 months. We always teach him to be caring, right? I think that's kind of the first and foremost thing you have to learn is how do you share he really looks out for her, you know what I mean? He doesn't push her, he shares, and he's really caring and compassionate with her, and I think that makes me really proud, because he's smart and rambunctious, but when it comes to his sister, he's very caring and compassionate. We've also got him involved in a lot of like sports and teams, and, and luckily he's, he's got a nice athletic ability to him. Uh, he's not the best player on every team, but he really enjoys being a teammate 
And I think that's really important as well, is Absolutely. how do you be a good teammate? You know that from the workplace. For I mean, sure. Being a good teammate, unless you're going to be a serial entrepreneur and go your, your own way, your whole way, you have to learn to be a good teammate. Even as a CEO like I am now, I have a good team around me. And I, hopefully they think I'm a good teammate, but I have to have good teammate skills, even though when you're at the top, you have to rely on people. So I think, you know, they're young. So other than the potty training and sleeping at night. <laughs> here's how to use a fork. Here's yeah. how to use a fork. Yeah. Um, don't stab anybody in the eye with it. <laughs> really teaching compassion and it really starts at home with the people that they're with all the time it, it being a good classmate being a good teammate it's those funny. are the foundations for good development i agree totally and i think that you when you're building your family you realize that your family is kind of the first team you're a part of right yeah. so like all of a sudden you're talking about your i never kids thought of it and, that way but yes you're and, right. I, and i have a boy and a girl also and same thing my son has just always been really compassionate to his sister and he looks out for her and he worries about her right. and now he worries about her in a different way as they're getting older and it's, it's kind of it's an interesting dynamic to, to watch happen. Um, so you take this time in the wilderness, mm -hmm. you come back. How does that impact the next choices that you make in life? And where do you go after that? You're upon what well, you're coming back as a senior, right? Yeah. So my yeah. Se senior year at Lehigh was really a transition year into what I wanted to do because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I even joke with my employees today. I still don't know what I want to do. <laughs> um, but I found something that I'm very good at. So... I'm doing it, but for me, I knew I wanted to be in New York City. So I grew up outside New York City. I'd always wanted to live in New York. A lot of my friends had jobs in New York City. The problem was a lot of them were finance jobs and I was uh, a history and international relations major. So what could I do and what could I do is I could sell. So I had the people and the relationship skills to do business development. So I started selling investment products in 2003, which was Kind of like a boiler room type. Yeah. If you ever watch those movies mm -hmm. where everybody's on the phone. I mean, those are the only firms that would give me a shot, you know, because I didn't have that finance pedigree to get into a JP Morgan or a Fidelity at that time. Um, so I did that for about two and a half years. I was very lucky. I had a great mentor. But when people think of those movies, yes. it's really like that, right? I mean, that to a certain extent, obviously not. With, without but, some of the... The loud yeah. and it's chaotic and you're just calling and... It, it's loud. It's chaotic. It's... Looking back on it, I remember the fun stuff, but there was also some really frustrating dark times when, you know, you've just worked really hard for nothing or, you know, you're getting the phone slammed on you every five minutes. Because this is obviously before social media and really email for that matter uh, wasn't even that popular. I had just gotten my first email address, I think, a year before I started working there. So uh, we didn't even have our own computers at our desks. We used shared terminals. So it was such a different way of working. It's hard for people to understand yeah. that now. Um, but it wasn't the financial excess or the drug excess or the, but um, the intensity sexual of excess the job, that you see in the movies. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but what I'm talking about is like that idea that you had to kind of put yourself out there. Yeah. I mean, now looking at what, what were some of the skills that you gained through that? And it's not an easy job. I mean, that's a really tough tough job to go to every day. So, so one of the first things I learned was to develop a thick skin, to be patient. Um, also to align yourself with people that are good people versus people that are out to make a quick buck. So people that really are doing what they say they're going to do and follow through on that. It was really a good learning experience just to sit back and watch. Even if you don't work there, it'd be interesting just to sit on the, sit on the sidelines for six months and see how people behave. Um, I've always loved that show, um, Undercover Boss, because okay. I always thought it was kind of cool, but... I don't know, I, I have this concept that it would be neat to have some sort of show where you could be like an intern or a shadow for one week at a, at jobs, but various jobs. Right. Like it? So yeah. So I could come shadow you for a week and I could shadow like a garbage man for a week and yeah. then I could shadow a florist for a week and just see like what these careers are like. I just yeah. think it would be super fascinating. So what you learned key things I'm sure that you've taken with you. A lot of key things. It really kind of gave me um, a great sales and trading background. It really helped me learn the language of investments and finance that I didn't learn in school. So I had to learn it kind of through the school of hard knocks for lack of a better term. Um, it also taught me what I didn't want to do as well and who I didn't want to be. And when I talk to kids at Lehigh or um, when I talk about career development, whether in the company or in the industry, use those first two to three years. If you don't know what you want to do, figure out what you don't want to do. I always N say Narrow the, the same list down, thing. you know? I always say the same thing. Yeah. I say, just get a job. Just take a job. Take doesn't a job. matter. Like any job is going to teach you at the very least what you don't want to be doing. Right. And the kind of people you don't want to be around, which helps narrow down the list. Right. 
And I live with three other guys in an apartment, you know, in Harlem. Yeah. And we had a ball, you know, and we saved up our money to go out on the weekends. And that's what we did. But after two and a half years, it had kind of run its course. And I was offered, I created an internship program while I was there. It was my first management experience. So my mentor's like, hey, look, you got good leadership skills, management skills. You're a good salesperson, but you'd probably be a better sales manager. So we want to start this internship program. Why don't you get it off the ground here in New York? So I did it, and it was so successful that um, the company I was working for wanted me to do it nationally. And I almost moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 2015. And I was getting a job offer from Fidelity at the same time. And you asked me about my wife. And at that time, we were kind of getting back together from being apart in college. And I was like, you know, I think I'm going to stay here for a little bit longer. And I ended up going to work for Fidelity. That's really where I learned the financial advisory wealth management business was was in a in a firm that size that did it that well it's interesting to hear the pieces of the puzzle come together right you know just from it, leadership yeah. of student council and football and then going on this amazing adventure with Knowles and then doing the call center right. and management training and all of a sudden now you're in the finance world right and let's talk about Erica a little bit so sure. you met your wife Erica at Lehigh yep yeah. and tell me a little bit about your relationship and how long you guys have been married um, so we met uh, first day of sophomore year. My fraternity was moving in freshman, and I got a chance to meet her because her sorority was doing the same thing. And uh, we started dating after that. We dated all through college. And then when I went to go to New York after my graduation, she stayed for her fifth year at Lehigh. She's the smart one in the family, just like my <laughs> sister was. So she stayed for her master's, and I went off to a call center. That's kind of Lehigh was ushering me out the door at that point. And um, we spent a year or two kind of during that period of time apart. It was very difficult for us to maintain the relationship long distance. We were in two different worlds. We were young. Um, and then she moved to New York herself. Um, and we really didn't see each other for a couple of years. And then we kind of ran into each other just at an event started seeing each other again. And I think we both realized that even though we were dating other people and had some time apart, that we didn't find anybody else that we enjoyed being with other than each other. So that was it. We were married 10 years ago this month. That's amazing. Congratulations. That's great. And she's from the Lehigh Valley. She is. And so at what point did the two of you make the the move? Do you say we're going to leave New York and start a family and move back here? After the financial crisis in 08, 09, um, Things changed dramatically for me at Fidelity. Um, I think when I was at Fidelity, I I thought maybe I would spend my whole career there. You know, my dad was at IBM for 31 years. I had this great corporation that I worked for. And I really saw how they treated clients. And I'm not knocking Fidelity by any means, but Fidelity makes money by people staying invested in their mutual funds. And in 2008 and 9, we knew that we were going through a catastrophic market drop. And Fidelity Corporation was tasking us with keeping the corporation afloat versus rather what was in our clients' best interests. So when I first got married, this was a few years before the financial crisis or right after the financial crisis, my father-in-law, who obviously was here in the Lehigh Valley and ran a small investment advisory firm, said, why don't you come work for me? And I said, no, I don't want to go to Lehigh Valley and I certainly don't want to work for my father-in-law, but but thank you. We'll see you at Thanksgiving (laughs) kind of a thing. And... um, About three years after that, you know, I left Fidelity and I went to HSBC to do some global banking just to get a different perspective. Uh, Fidelity and I parted ways and I I hated that job. The bank was still picking up the pieces from the financial crisis. Basically, I was hired to pick up glass, (laughs) you know, from just how damaging that was. And so being independent and being at a smaller firm and leveraging a lot of the experience I had uh, became very attractive. So what we did is we made a decision to look at coming to Lehigh Valley. So I joined my father-in-law's company, which is Valley National. And I came here three days a week from New York. And I worked two days, in New- two days a week in New- or came here three days a week, two days in New York. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, so you were actually reverse so I tried commuting. It, I tried it out for two years before I really decided to join him full time. I wanted to make sure the area was growing. I wanted to make sure I didn't know a lot about the Lehigh Valley. Well, I didn't know a lot a about re- his business. Really different type of business. I mean, you've yep. been in this big corp- corporate culture sure. in New York City. You've worked international. And right. Totally different. Why was the transition to a smaller, you know, banking financial institution type? situation important to you? I mean, why was that something that you thought, okay, now I'm ready to do this? Well, it gets, it gets back to what do you really like to do, right? And 
I enjoy financial markets. I enjoy everything about what I do. I'm very passionate about it, but I was struggling to help people. I was struggling to be independent in my thinking when you work for a very large corporation. And when I came here, I could have those types of things. And I was also seasoned enough in my career to make independent decisions. I love that. It's like the perfect thing at the perfect yeah. time. And the funny thing too is, is Tom had started his business in 1985. And in 2011, you know, it needed some work. You know, there were great advisors there. Tom is probably one of the best financial advisors I've ever been around. Um, but his practice had grown to the point where he really needed somebody with outside expertise to come in. He really needed a manager. Yeah. So putting new systems in place, reinventing them. And, and of course, the world had changed so dramatically. Sure. I mean, what had happened from, you know, the early, late 90s, early 2000s, up until that point in 2011, 12. Right. It was like just, I mean, it's arguably, right, like the 10 biggest years in history, speaking of history. I think we're going to look back and say, right. what happened there? Right. So it yeah. gave me an opportunity to really come in um, and become the chief operating officer, which I did, I think, seven years ago. Um, and I did that for six years um, of really restructuring the business and growing it. We were $490 million under management when I joined, and we're almost $1.1 billion today. Wow, so that's it's a tremendous growth, growth story. Um, Tom and a lot of his staff that built the business were so integral in allowing me to come in and really gave me a lot of room to run and make decisions and slowly kind of take over the operations of the business. Um, we have almost 40 employees now. So it's really a tremendous story. And One of the things that I, I love um, about Valley National and what I see in the community is you guys are really present in the community. You've yeah. made a huge commitment. Tell me about some of the things that are important to you and why is that give back piece such a part of the fiber of the business? Well, the majority of our clients and families that do business with us are in the community. So we obviously have a vested interest in seeing the Lehigh Valley and the community be really successful. Um, but it also goes back to our core values and who we are and who we hire and who we bring into the business. So if we're a client first organization, People we hire by nature are volunteers. They give back. So we want to arm them with the capability to get involved in the community, build relationships in the community, and give back, you know, leave their neighborhood, leave whatever they're passionate about in a better place. Um, we have a weekly newsletter that we send out, and I think one of our junior associates um, who's really involved in ArtsQuest just got a certification. You know, so we're always doing as kind of a certified volunteer to, to do things at ArtsQuest. So I think we're always pushing our individual employees and then obviously our brand as it grows, um, it's nice to put our brand next to things that really matter to either our employees or our clients. Well, I'm lucky enough to also know your in-laws who are okay. amazing people. They are. Tell me a little bit about the dynamic. And I come from family business. Sure. So tell me a little bit about that dynamic. You know, Tom had thought that would be a good fit for you early on. You, you politely declined, but then ended up coming in. And now there's been this, you know, kind of amazing growth and opportunity. What is the dynamic of being a part of a family business? It's challenging at times, but I think Tom and I have a really special relationship. Um, he's a very calm, calculated individual, really and I'm a little bit more of the louder, dynamic, you may not think so, but louder, <laughs> dynamic um, person, and he does a very good job of being patient with me. Um, we do a very good job of separating business and personal life. Um, when I first joined there, and there was really a lot of transition going on, we spent a lot of time both in the office and outside of the office talking about business because there was so much we needed to accomplish. I would say today, Tom has really done a great job of stepping away from the operations of the business and focusing on just some of his clients. And then he's also the chairman of the company. So just kind of keeping an eye on things from a, from a board governance level. And I'd say we don't really talk about work outside of work. We really try to keep it about the grandchildren. And I was just going to say, now there are grandchildren. Like, yeah, it's like separating church and, church and state yeah, now. Totally. You know? um, what, what about the, what about the guiding principles of the company? I mean, did you guys find that you were always very aligned in that way? I mean, certainly they are very good to the community um, and have been for, mm -hmm. for a very long time. Did you come in and find that there was a lot of alignment on your motivation? A absolutely. I think... What's interesting is Tom is very different in the way that he thinks about things within the financial advisory and operations of the business than I am at times. But the core values of what he holds dear to his heart and put in the company are the core values that I grew up with. 
So we never have a disagreement about the hard rock values of what the business is going to do. Our business model, although it evolves over time, we are both in 100% agreement that's the right business model moving forward. Uh, we do disagree on little operational items and things, and I think that's just any business yeah. relationship is going to have that. But knowing that the really important things, the deal-breaking things, were in 100% alignment and have always been has made it very easy for us to work together. I think that's the key because those little operational things you can come to resolution on, right? right? Like there's just two different approaches. But what motivates you and what kind of drives you to do what you do every day, I think you can't fake that and I think you can't really change that in a person. I think you have to be aligned and I have found in, in growing this business that having people that also follow your core values and your mission right. um, and believe in it is so, so important. So it's such a, it's a great thing. Let's talk about your kids and your family a little bit. Okay. You, you talked a little bit about your son and your daughter. Tell yep. me their names, their ages, and what are they kind of into? So my four and a half year old, his name's Max. He's really into math and basketball. So he has my wife's brain. He's very smart with numbers. He loves numbers, which got him into basketball because I was watching a basketball game on TV and he was watching the numbers change on the score. It's like a two and a half, three year old. That's so cool. And he's so into math. He's very advanced with his math. Um, he's super he's cute. He's like my little nerd. He's super <laughs> cute. He loves golf and basketball. Um, he loves being out on the six hole course and um, driving around in the cart and hitting shots. He's going to do junior golf this year. And he's. Uh, yeah, he's 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 a piece of work. He's got infinite energy. It's amazing. Yeah, it's I don't know where. I don't know where what about your from. daughter? Emma's fifteen months, and she's the fearless one. Max is the analytical, calculated one. He's got a lot of energy, but he likes to stay in his comfort zone. Emma, the just first moment, the first moment we left her alone by the side of the tub, she jumped in fully clothed. You know, I mean, she's <laughs> she's she's beautiful. She's rambunctious. She she's just a piece of work. Yeah, yeah she's gonna be trouble when she's older. I bet. And you guys have kind of a fun dynamic because your sister-in-law and uh, is having kids at the same time, right? You yes. have like cousins sort of the same age. Yeah, Erica's youngest sister, Jen, um, who lives in, who lives like right down the street from us, has a boy and a girl literally like the same age. Yeah, it's fun. It's the fun watching all the pictures. The do not do anything separate. Uh, they're, they're, they love being in tandem. But it's kind of fun because you've got this brunette blonde dynamic. Erica's yes. very brunette and your kids are kind of, you know, darker and her kids right, are blonde. Right, because Erica and managed like, me. I'm an Italian. And then yeah. uh, Jennifer married someone who's definitely really, more blonde and like they almost have like redhead children. So you get them together. They don't look anything alike. No, but they yeah. couldn't be closer. And what a fun time that is. How has the dynamic changed over the years for you and Erica now that you're both working parents and you're building a business, she works community foundation, and she's out there you know, doing so much good in our community. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about that shift being working parents. It's hard. It is. It's very difficult. We a have lot to, of negotiating, right? A lot of negotiating, but <laughs> you have to work on it. Yeah. Like if you think it's just going to naturally happen, I think you're if you're thinking about getting into that type of an environment where you've got two dynamic, busy working spouses, with kids and everything that comes with it in today's life, you really got to do advanced planning and be on top of things. Erica's like so organized to a T, so that makes it very easy. Um, she's always got, we've got calendars all over the place and we've got kind of three months out kind of on everything we're going to do. So a lot of it's just negotiation, working on things together, um, trying to make time for each other, but it is very challenging. In fact, I'd say... You could probably attest to this. Yeah. When your kids are our age, four and a half, one, two years old, it's very hard to find time for, for, for each, each other. other. And, yeah, and, and you're both working is... in dynamic jobs like yeah. you, know, you and your husband are too. So it, it's challenging and, yeah. and it takes work. I mean, the way I look at it is you've got to kind of work on like three things, right? So you've got to work on your physical health, right? You've got to be physically healthy, feeling good about yourself, Um that helps you deal with everything, being mentally healthy, right? So you want to make sure that you're continuing to be mindful or do whatever it is to limit the stress that's in your mind so you don't bring that home and bring that environment. And then, you know, my plug is you've got to be financially healthy too. A lot of relationships, when people start having families, they start getting um, really financially strapped or uh, don't have time to work on their finances and let them kind of drift off. So that's kind of the way that I think of things strategically in my family life, especially within, you know, my relationship with Erica are we working on those three things and I find if we're balancing those things really well we tend to be a lot happier and most importantly I think you're saying that you're working on it and, and that's yeah. it. you just got to be aware communication has to be open and I think the plug for the I think the plug for the financial aspect is is critical because often I think people think they need to start working on something when they're in it 
-hmm. and you talked about planning your schedule and you know finances are the same thing i mean people sort of have these ideas about getting married and owning a home and having kids and those things and retiring and those things really take advanced planning. They're not, they don't need to be super complicated, but they do no. need to be something you don't ignore right. until it's a problem. Right. Sort of like your health. <laughs> so I like that analogy. I think that's great. It is. And for me, the finance piece comes really easy because it's what I do every day. Yeah, but exactly. I'm not a doctor and I'm not a fitness <laughs> expert. So, you know, and I'm not a mental expert. So some of those things, you know, you have to go out and enlist help to help you find out what's best for you. Well, I have good news for you about the kid thing. Good. Um, you're about to enter the seven golden years of parenting, which is mm -hmm. what my dad has coined, ages four to 11. 11. So you're in it with I'm Max. Ready. I'm ready for When it. Emma gets there, you'll be there. Just enjoy those times. Travel a lot. Go mm -hmm. out a lot. Do more than you think is financially prudent. Okay. Because those years are just the greatest. They're awesome. they're awesome. They're potty trained and they eat stuff and they travel well and they have fun and they're engaging and so really enjoy. Then then you get back to the teen and that's a little bit like having toddlers again, but right. but it's all right. I'm enjoying this stage too. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. Well, yeah. before I let you go, I, mm -hmm. we do a little rapid fire here. Sure. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. What is one place that you have been that is the best place you've ever gone? Bali. Bali. That's so cool. That's on my list. What is one place you've never been that you'd like to go? I'm spoiled. I've been a lot of places. Um, Thailand. Okay. If you were not in the job that you are in now, what job would you have? I'd be a professor. I knew you were going to say that. I had this sense you were going to say history professor or something. Maybe. Something like yeah, that. Okay. I don't know. All right. If you could have one final meal. Somewhere I could meal, write and study and teach and interact. Yeah. What would be your final meal? Best thing you could eat? <laughs> um, I would have to say some sort of pasta. Some sort of pasta. Yeah, guilty pleasure. Yeah, I'm trying to cut that out, so I'm like kind of craving that I now, so that's going off the top of my it's list. It's amazing when you say you can't have something. If you can't have you it ever it, again, I, I really want it. So um, I love pasta. I could eat it every day of the every I know, day of the me week. too. I actually did that once when I traveled anyway, abroad in Italy, yeah. and I couldn't fit my pants on when I came home, so... Not recommended. But worth it, right? It was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> I was young. It was fine. Yeah. All right. Um, if you could have dinner with three people here or not with us any longer, who would those people be? Um, well, I've got to have some historic characters. So uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, and my father. Awesome. Love that. That would be a really That would be what a cool wild dinner, table. right? That would be a really <laughs> loud table. <laughs> um, if you had to describe yourself in three words, what would those three words be? Focused, strategic, and caring. Excellent. I love that. Do you have a favorite book or a book that is a, a go-to for you, whether it's enjoyment or self-help or any of those things? Um... I recently read a book, I don't remember the title of it, but it was about Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee and kind of the, how they grew up so differently and how they became two polarizing figures in the Civil War. That was something that was very That'd passionate really to me. Interesting. Yeah, Robert E. Lee grew up much more aristocratic, went to the, you know, was much more of an aristocratic officer where Ulysses S. Grant was more of a salt, salt yeah. of the earth <laughs> and just kind of how this terrible conflict in our country, in the end of the day, it came down to who was going to win between the two of them. And um, kind of the piece that they forged together, they, I, I think people like this is as Grant, Nelson Mandela, even Napoleon Bonaparte to a certain extent were very merciful in their how they made peace, and um, you know making sure that there weren't wasn't further conflict or you know strife, and I think that takes a lot of character. It does, and I love how you have really figured out how to utilize history to advance. Our current day. Right. I mean, that's the purpose of it, right? right. To remember. Uh, last thing that I'll ask you is, what would a perfect day be for you? Um, you probably already know what that's going to be. So a perfect day would definitely be golf. Golf, yes. I'd be playing golf. And then my, my perfect day is playing golf and then coming home to my family and having dinner and just spending time with them. I mean, that, that to me is my perfect day. That's the best. Well, with that, I'm going to let you go. Thank you for being Thanks. here. I appreciate, Ashley, I appreciate it. it. Matt Petrozelli, we've got Valley National Financial Advisors. This is a wonderful company who cares about their clients, their customers, and our community here in the Lehigh Valley. We're so happy to have had you here with us. Thank you. All right, All you've right. been listening to Unscripted with Russo. Until next time.